All right, our next speaker today is former Australian League footballer and advocate for junior doctor wellbeing, Merv Kane. Merv was born in 1953. He is a farm boy from Witchy Proof in Northwestern Victoria. He excelled at Australian football and carved himself a very successful career in the sport, playing, coaching, and later recruiting. He received great recognition from his home club, Richmond. He was selected into the Richmond team of the century, accepted into their Hall of Fame, and awarded a Richmond Life membership. In 2019, after completing 48 years of continuous service for the, to the football industry, he was also awarded an AFL Life membership. Merv married Kay in 1979, and they had three children together, Joel, Emily, and Zach. Sadly, Emily and Kay died in tragic circumstances in 2017. Emily was a brilliant trainee obstetrician and gynecologist who unfortunately suffered deeply in the last few years of her life. The stresses of her career contributed heavily to her untimely death. Merv's lecture today is titled Emily's Gumboots, the name of the advocacy and training initiative Merv has launched in his daughter's honour. Emily was well known at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne for wearing fluorescent gumboots in the operating theatre. And you're able to purchase a pair of these gumboots to support his project via his website. Please welcome Merv as he shares Emily's powerful story with us. Thank you, Katie. And to the Prevocational Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and all the other speakers, it's a privilege for me to be with you today speaking to hundreds of medical students uh, at this medical conference online, which is breaking new ground for me. My name is Merv Kane, and my daughter, my daughter Emily was our gift to the world. Emily gained her medical degree at the University of Melbourne in 2006. She was a beautiful girl. She touched every she touched people everywhere she went and she was loved by all those that she influenced. She became an obstetrician gynecologist working at the Royal Women's Hospital. More than a beautiful girl, she was a brilliant doctor who was seen to be excelling. Not only the technical and professional aspects of her career, but her ability to transfer knowledge and understanding to other young junior doctors around her. And also it was her personality to light up a hospital or a birthing room that shone through. Emily died two years ago because of, a, of an acute addiction to alcohol and associated, dep and associated depression. She was 36 years old. Naturally, this affected our family very severely. Emily had become an alcoholic and in the space of four to five years, her life was over. She rarely touched alcohol prior to this, only at social events like the spring racing carnival or Christmas day, etc. Emily died on 2nd of September, 2017. 25 days after her death, Emily's mother Kay took her own life because of the guilt and blame she felt as a mother. Kay blamed herself for Emily's demise, for letting her down as a mother, for not doing enough to support her and protect her. Nothing could have been further from the truth as Kay and Emily shared an unbreakable bond as mother and daughter can. Where Emily's troubles began, gained momentum, accelerated, and eventually spiraled out of control to her death is hard to tell. I haven't been able to piece that together since those events leading to 2017. We are and were a normal family, loving, caring, hardworking. Family is and was everything to us. Everything seemed to come easily to Emily. But beneath that easygoing, relaxed exterior, she was also extremely tough and resilient inside. She studied long and hard, and she had a wonderful retentive memory. She was a perfectionist. 
In her early 30s, she started drinking heavily and excessively and secretly. Soon her drinking was out of control and she was losing control of her daily life and her profession. I began driving her to work at the Royal Women's Hospital, dropping her off and picking her up. I was extremely worried about her working patterns and some of her behaviours, which had the potential to put at risk the health and well-being of patients. It was a very, very dangerous game she was playing. I was expressing my concern about her behaviour to senior staff at the hospital as she continued to work double shifts and long hours. At work, she was guilty of presenteeism. She would always take that extra shift. I began to watch her from a distance at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, on the other side of Flemington Road, hiding behind a tree, as she walked to the IGA bottle shop to buy a bottle of vodka. And some days it was two bottles of vodka. But in Emily's eyes, she pretended to be coping. She didn't have a problem. She didn't want to involve family, but more often than not, family would bear the brunt of her alcoholism and depression and associated behaviours. Obviously, she was hide, hiding a lot of things inside, despite her toughness and resilience within, which was proving counterproductive. Things were going desperately wrong in her life. So morally, I took things into my hands to report my daughter to the medical board. An extremely difficult decision, as you can appreciate. Emily attempted full-time rehabilitation programs several times. She also tried day programs. She would get better, return to her beautiful self, but not for long. She was talking to psychologists and psych psychi psychi psychiatrist but most often she tried to bluff her way through frequently endeavoring to outsmart her fellow professionals medical people are very cunning at trying to outsmart one another ultimately Emily couldn't manage to even open her mail or do her shopping or pay her bills she had long been disconnected from close friends and work colleagues. One such letter I found after her passing, Emily's passing, was a letter from the medical board, unopened, advising Emily of her suspension for missing vital commitments affecting her career. Both seriously ill and frightened, she, she didn't want to open the letter. Sadly, the final product paragraph of the letter was asking Emily for feedback to the medical board on how they had handled her situation. As I saw it, dying represented the only way to find peace and respite for Emily's misery. So sick had she become, living was not an option. She suffered enormous, enormously with her illness, feelings of guilt and shame and failure and embarrassment. She cried every day or nearly every day and inwardly, I was crying too. All those terrible emotions from a girl once driven to be the brightest star, the very best in her profession. Now she lay sick in her bed, blind drunk by nine o'clock in the morning. As Kay and I were subconsciously and silently preparing for her to die. One thing is for sure, Emily didn't deserve this fate. She deserved much better, as her overwhelming commitment in life was to help people and bring happiness to people, not only in her professional life, but family and friends as well. Emily Kane will not die in vain. We are working with medical students and junior doctors as we are today because ultimately we want you to thrive and flourish in your profession, which leads me to speak to you. So what is the root cause of this carnage in Emily's, in Emily's case? Is it blame or is it change? Is it perception or is it reality? Many people listening to this 
believe we need change? Who believes we need change? Who believes we don't? The Emily Kane Gumboot Program was founded at the Royal Women's Hospital. Emily was well known, as Katie stated, for wearing her bright coloured gumboots in the birthing suit, the kind you see in the background. Not only did she, uh, not only did it keep her socks dry, they were great camouflage for all manner of things during a patient's labour. These fluoro coloured gum boots symbolise change. They symbolise awareness of self and others around you. They also symbolise hope and joy and success. So I would invite you to, to buy a pair of gum boots and wear them with purpose. And you can uh, refer to my website at uh, murfkane.com.au on the screen. Who in this room that I'm talking to believes in the power of proximity? That is, we are here at a hospital or in a birthing suite or in a staff room and, and we observe things firsthand. Perhaps we see inconvenient things and we understand why they happen, but we recognise a need to change. From the boardroom down, things need firstly to be acknowledged and things need to change. Thing that, things need to change at all levels, from the CEO to the CMO, to doctors, midwives and nurses. Again, is this a perception or is it a reality? We are all in this together and we need to put our arms around each other because none of us are bulletproof. At the same time, competition is healthy and positive tension is healthy. We are, after all, after all, quite naturally, born to compete. But things can and do go wrong. Who reaches for a Red Bull or a can of Coke or a long black coffee as they burst through the door of a birthing suite or onto a hospital ward or into an office for a meeting? I know Emily did. That culture needs to change subtly. Why not reach for a fresh banana or an orange? There needs to be a cultural shift. Through our experiences, it is, it is apparent that medical people do find it hard to change or accept change, or are reluctant to seek, seek help, or find help, or ask for help. Is it true that only one in 30 junior doctors have their own GP? That is a clear message in itself. Medical people find it hard to be comfortable feeling vulnerable. This is often the case with high achievers. Feeling vulnerable or feeling under pressure is not a weakness. Feeling vulnerable is okay. Feeling vulnerable is a measurement of courage. Feeling vulnerable is essential. There are, after all, we all have downsides in everyone's life. At the same time, pressure is a privilege. It's the profession you have chosen. Pressure and privilege are feelings you must embrace and enjoy that responsibility. Families such as mine with high achieving children need to be better educated. We need to be educated right from the time our daughter or our son commences a medical degree. We need to be encouraged to sit around the kitchen table as a family with our son or daughter and perhaps a welfare coordinator. Family, families need to be built into the medical curriculum. We need to be made aware of the pitfalls because essentially in many instances, Families are still the primary carers in the early stages of a medical degree. Young doctors need to be aware of the pit, pitfalls, not just the joy of a healthy patient. I recently attended a workshop of junior doctors at Ranscog, and I was taken aback that the only issues openly discussed were bullying from higher levels, along with stress, long hours and double shifts. But is it bullying or are people being put in their place or they are, are they undervalued 
or are young people being too sensitive? I don't know the answer to that. At the workshop, not once did I hear mentioned of a mother or a baby or a family. A far cry from the exhilaration and the ambition of becoming a young obstetrician or gynaecologist. I would love to hear young doctors talking about a mother, a baby and a family at the next workshop. We are trying to close the gap around wellness and well-being. And that gap is having the courage to speak up and ask for help and look at looking out for others who may need help and occasionally feel vulnerable. And that needs to become genuine. So check yourself and others around you. Are you loving your job? Check your, check your nutrition, your exercise, rest, sleep, finances, personal time, family time, and time for friends. It has taken enormous courage for you to choose your career. So far, you have given much and you have much to give. Constant study, retaining information, long hours with no guarantees. I admire your willingness with no guarantees. You have made enormous sacrifices and you expose yourself to, to emotional risk. You must invest in yourself and hospitals must invest in you. We are becoming a society of box, box tickers, I feel. You see it everywhere. We are happy to tick a box and we condone it, but who, who is prepared to make a stand in the power of, of proximity when we see something inconvenient? Somewhere, something, somewhere, someone has been letting us down unwittingly and unknowingly. Feeling tired, burnt out, worn out is hardly the answer. You deserve to love your life, love your profession. So I encourage you to step forward and don't step back. We need you at your best every day. Feeling fresh and bold and invigorated every day. Not drained and fatigued. You are intelligent, highly educated people with brilliant minds. You are wonderfully caring and dedicated people. Finding time in the chaos is your greatest challenge. You have to be aware of that. As a community, we place you on a pedestal and rightfully so. As a community, as an institution, and particularly in the hospital environment, we need, we need you to thrive and, and flourish. We need you to provide high quality care and safety and well-being for our patients every day, for our extraordinarily gifted professionals performing at an optimum level. But life is about everyday living and everyday people. So you need to strike that balance. We need you at your best. Let's get it right today. And I'm deeply passionate about what you do. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Merv. That was a very powerful lecture. And I think in a time where there is increased pressure um, on us, each other, um, it's, a, it's a timely reminder to look out for our own health. Um, I think your work goes a long way to breaking down the stigma associated uh, with talking out about mental health problems in our industry. And um, it sounds like Emily really did love her job. So we need to look out for each other so that everyone can continue doing their job. Um, we have a question from Shiva who says, thank you for sharing uh, your story and Emily's story. What sort of things can we look out for in our colleagues who may be going through something similar? And what do you think we can do to help them? I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's around communication and um, encouraging, encouraging that at home. Um, Emily, uh, obviously, and all doctors, you know, they're focused, they have to be focused, but she would come home, she actually become the soapy queen. She'd come home, sit in front of the TV, watch the soapies. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very big and, and, and also with my football career, finishing up with recruiting. I think it's very important that we do need to sit around the kitchen table. When, when I'm recruiting, I sit around the kitchen table with the player and also the parents. 
and we discuss openly, you know, what sort of what sort of boy we may be going to recruit. So I think that can refer to the, um, the medical profession as well. Families being prepared to sit around the, the kitchen table. We don't need to know all the all the intimate details and perhaps the gory details, but just that conversation, I think, is is extremely important. Absolutely, and thank you so much, and thank you. Um, for working with Ranscog and to Ranscog for taking all this on board and trying to make the workplace a more positive and supportive place for us all. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. We're gonna